college, roommates, dating, philanthropy, muffins, and podcast. What do all of these have in common? By themselves, nothing. But together, they represent my passion for side projects over the years. Some people are serial entrepreneurs. They love launching companies. I am a serial side projectpreneur. <laughs> I love taking an idea and turning it into reality. It gives me joy, energy, and independence. And the ROI can only be measured in creative returns and in how much these side projects make my heart beat. I first fell in love with side projects as a kid. As an only child, I craved constant stimulation. So my parents sent me to art camp, drama camp, and piano lessons on my quest to become a true Renaissance girl, a lover of the arts and the sciences. There was a time I wanted to be an astronaut, but that ended quickly because I didn't like space ice cream. <laughs> Fast forward, I grew up, went to college, and began to pursue an even more rigorous academic curriculum. And I found my side projects to be few and far between, because like my peers, I felt this pressure to pursue a career in consulting or banking and this dream of moving to New York City after we graduated. Well, I decided I would move to New York City, but I did it in my own creative way as an assistant to a philanthropist. I became Harold's full-time speechwriter, researcher, and proud backpack carrier. <laughs> I loved this first job, and for the first time in my adult life, I worked from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. I had time before, during on my lunch break, after work, and on the weekends to think. And that was dangerous, but in a good way. You see, I had everything possible to make me happy living in New York City. A great job, good friends, fun things to explore. But something was missing. I craved that creativity from my childhood. So I thought about, how could I bring it back? And I considered perhaps dancing or soccer, but that's not the direction I wanted to go. I craved a craft that I could call my own. And at the time, blogs were exploding in popularity. So of course, I wanted to start one, but I needed a theme. And I considered food, but that was already a super saturated marketplace. And someone had already come up with Julie and Julia. So I decided on my walk to work that I could write about this transition from college to the real world because it was a big one. And as I sat at my desk at my job reading the copy of the student newspaper that my boss had delivered, because yes, we both enjoyed keeping up with the breaking college news, despite the fact that I had graduated a year ago or less, and he had graduated 50-ish years ago. And it hit me, what if I wrote for them? I could share these transitions with college students. So I wrote to the editor of the Cornell Daily Sun and pitched one year out. And for a year, I chronicled these experiences. I compared dorm life to apartment living. I really missed leaving my door open for people to wander in. You can't do that in New York City. You don't want those strangers walking in. And I lamented about learning how to cook. I really missed the dining hall. And I shared my stories, my friends' stories, and other alumni stories. It was an incredibly fun year. And what I loved most about this side project is it taught me to pursue my dreams. Because, you see, I had been so focused on my career success as a college student, I didn't have time to write for the campus newspaper. And it taught me that there's the possibility of never giving up and exploring a dream even after you've graduated. And so I graduated a second time and decided to write about one of the topics I had explored in my column, roommates. Now, as college students, you are likely intimately familiar with this topic. Remember, I'm an only child. And 
As a freshman, I wisely requested a single room. And then I was an RA. So I never had a roommate until I was 23 years old. And when I moved to New York City, it was basically impossible to live alone. The cost of housing was astronomical. So I began a search for my first New York City apartment and a roommate, and it was an adventure. It was like sorority rush, but 10 times more competitive. <laughs> and as I searched for a roommate, I had an interim roommate. I lived with a 75-year-old who was the grandmother of the guy I was dating at the time. <laughs> I wish I had a picture of us. We had the best time together. She was probably one of my favorite roommates, but eventually, I needed to find someone my own age to live with, and I did. And as many of you might relate, it was special, awkward, unique, all of those feelings, and I decided it was time to actually finally start that blog, and it became Roommate for Rent. Now, before you judge me, let me clarify three things. I only wrote in first person anonymous. No one knew if I was writing about my stories or my friends' stories or the random people who confess their stories to me at bars late at night. I also never wrote about somebody when I lived with them. That seemed only fair. I waited until after. <laughs> and I come from a family where we turn lemons into lemonade, so I focused on the funny. The ridiculous experiences like cleaning and issues related to cooking and so many adventures that I chronicled in Roommate for Rent. I loved this blog so much that I would go out late at night to bars and bring a notebook and ask people their stories, or I would set up a booth. Here I am with a friend at the Brooklyn Flea Market. And after a while, I decided one late night that I would turn it into a comedy show. So I cast my friends in a one-night sold-out show in New York City, very much off, off, off Broadway. <laughs> but it was a hit. I cast my friends as the actors and actresses, including a 25-year-old who played my 75-year-old first roommate. And she was the star of the show. But eventually, something crazy happened. I actually got a great roommate. And the passion that had fueled Roommate for Rent dwindled, and I decided to put it on pause and get a bit more personal. But before I tell you what I did, I want to tell you the biggest lessons that I got from Roommate for Rent, and that was to look for the laughter. Because in challenging situations, if you try to find what can make you smile, you can get through it a lot easier. And I discovered the power and possibility of talking to strangers and decided that I loved it and would continue that theme through many of my side projects. So when I turned 30, I decided to make myself a side project, and I went on 30 dates for my 30th birthday. <laughs> Here is the backstory of why and what happened. My grandma passed away when I was 29 years old, and she was the light of my life. She was my baking partner. She taught me everything I know about baking. She was my clearance shopping buddy and my literary cheerleader. And she had one wish for me, to find a nice guy and settle down. I wasn't having it. I didn't want commitment, and I also wasn't meeting the right guys. So she wanted me to go on The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. That wasn't for me. And I decided to do it my way. So very publicly on social media, I declared I was going on 30 dates for my 30th birthday. I felt that I needed to harness all the gumption that Grandma had taught me it was possible to have, a word she loved dearly, and ask my friends, you know, the people I knew on Facebook who I wasn't quite sure who we had, how we had become friends, but we were friends, the long-lost relatives, my coworkers, anyone who knew me at all, to think about who they would set me up with. Because in this world of online dating and apps, the art of matchmaking had basically disappeared, so I wanted to turn to them to make an introduction. And I went on a lot of dates. They were fun, they were interesting, and about halfway through, I decided to do what I do best. I wrote about it in the Huffington Post. And it was at that moment that I realized I didn't want my dating life in the public eye, and the internet was not kind. I discovered there were trolls, and they didn't have colorful hair. They were mean people. 
And I went on a few more dates, but eventually I put 30 for 30 on hold with the hope of someday meeting Mr. 30 and finding the right guy. But even though this side project didn't end the way I wanted it to, it gave me a love and the power of controlling your destiny. Because if I hadn't tried it, I would have never known who I could have met along the way. And I'm glad that I did. But it made me realize that my next side project would do a complete 180. Instead of personal, it would focus on my career. I was working as a fundraiser in New York City and I would meet young philanthropists who wanted to know if their gift mattered. I told them it did, but I needed to show them why, and I began interviewing them. Full-time nonprofit professionals, volunteers, board members, eventually I told 150 stories of ordinary philanthropists, people who were giving time, money, or expertise. I even interviewed Kasha, a guide dog for the blind. She was one of my best interviews. <laughs> And through Why We Give, I discovered this incredible power of ownership. Because some of you may have found this out already through an internship or a job experience, but sometimes you have to ask for permission at work. And with my side project, especially this one, I didn't have to ask for permission. I had the ownership, and I could experiment and create in fun ways. I also discovered a love for serendipity, because you see, when you start one side project, you never know where it can lead. And with Why We Give, it led to an extraordinary result. Early on, I interviewed Jacob the Muffin Man Kaufman. We were introduced through a friend. This is actually the fourth time we have ever met in person, and it was taken at the end of last year. Jacob lived in San Francisco, I lived in New York. He was baking muffins and handing them out to people experiencing homelessness in San Francisco. And he was doing it out of the kindness of his heart. When I heard his story, I didn't want to just write about it on my blog. I wanted to invite people to participate. So together, we invented National Muffin Day. And this is the fifth year of the holiday. It's a philanthropic movement where we invite people to bake with us. And over the years, 500 muffin tiers have baked nearly 6,000 muffins in 25 cities and raised thousands of dollars for causes helping people who are experiencing homelessness. Because the muffin man and his family and friends donate money per baker, this year it's up to $40 per baker. And the way we track this is with a hashtag of give muffins. People bake at home, in their kitchens, or with their friends, and then you share on social media and deliver to a shelter or directly to people on the street. Because the muffin is just the beginning. We don't think it's going to solve hunger or homelessness, but it's something personal for a population that rarely gets anything personal. They often get leftovers or a vast pot from a soup kitchen. And so this is our way of contributing, raising awareness, and making a difference. Over the years, our bakers have become a movement. We call them muffinteers, volunteer bakers. And they are a lot of fun. They range from moms and their children and dads and their children to professional chefs to um, Instagram food creators to brands. Like this week, Bob's Red Mill of the famous Oats and Flour posted about National Muffin Day. And we've gotten some really fun press. We're humbled and honored to have been featured on Forbes, CNN, and Inside Edition. So tomorrow is National Muffin Day, and I hear there's a baking party happening at Emory. So if you're interested in joining, you can let us know. But what I have loved most about Muffin Day was really hard to pick. But I want to tell you, I love muffins. And my friends know I love muffins, too. They give them to me on every special occasion, including a recent work anniversary party. I also love Bitmoji, those colorful cartoon characters. They can express so much more than just people sometimes. And it's been hilarious to see our Bitmoji on national TV. Impact. Like I said, Muffin Day is about making a difference in people's communities. And finally, community. Muffin Day is about bringing people together to notice who lives around you and how you can help them. And through Muffin Day, I realized how much I loved creating philanthropic communities, bringing stories to life. 
And I kicked off a dinner series called Philanthropic Fridays, where once a month, for a year, on Friday night, I hosted a dinner through the nourishment of One Table, an incredible nonprofit that believes in Friday nights with intention. My friend Allie co-hosted at her apartment, and we had a great time bringing together people to talk about giving. And thankfully, Ali said yes to my crazy invitations. I would invite old friends from camp and new friends who I met on Twitter, and they all added to these incredible conversations because Philanthropic Friday came at a time when I needed it most in New York City. I was starting to get pretty homesick after a decade there, and I was thinking about moving home. And so I took my portfolios from all of my side projects, but in particular, Why We Give, National Muffin Day, and Philanthropic Friday, and was able to move back to Atlanta two years ago on Valentine's Day. And I landed a job in communications, so I transitioned career paths. And coming home has been such a gift. First, I've got to see the Braves in their new stadium. I miss Turner Field, but I'm getting used to the new space. And I realized something magical about side projects. They can come with you. So I brought all of mine, and National Muffin Day was extra sweet last year because I was living in Atlanta. But it also gives you the opportunity to reset and think, is there something you want to take on next? Because that's just how my mind works with these side projects. And I did. I launched a year ago tomorrow, probably my favorite side project yet. But don't tell the muffin man. Peach and Prosperity. It's a podcast that tells stories around Atlanta, from economic topics to cultural to historical. In this first year, we have told 13 stories, ranging from the local dog biscuit baker to Oakland Cemetery to Tiny Doors ATL. It has been so much fun to work on this side project. But what I love about it most is my co-founder. I co-host with my dad, and we have a ton of fun together. We have rediscovered in Atlanta that I left and that my parents hadn't seen before. And we have met so many incredible people through our side project this past year. My mom's involved, too. She's our unofficial photographer. But our friend Eugene is our real official photographer. What, what Peach and Prosperity has given me is a love for discovery, of seeing what's out there in your hometown or where you live. New skills. We had no idea how to edit, produce, or storytell before we set out on this, and we have gained all of those. And most importantly, dads are pretty incredible, and I want to give a shout out to mine for being awesome. I really appreciate everything that he has given me with this side project, and I hope that others can have that experience too. So, college, roommates, dating, philanthropy, muffins, and podcasts, what do all of these have in common? I think by now you know. They are my side project passions. They give me joy, energy, and independence. They are part of my identity. For the moment, they are just the right mix of challenging and inspiring. I sometimes wonder when the next side project idea will hit me. I don't have much room for them in my schedule, but I'm never one to say no to an idea. I also joke that one day, perhaps, I will work on side projects full time, one for each day of the work week, so five side projects would be amazing. But my wish for all of you is that you, too, can fall in love with side projects, because whether you're seeking that professional exploration or a personal spark, side projects can do that for you and more, and all it takes is one idea to explore, to see where it will lead, and if you want to brainstorm, I'll be around during the break to help you. Most importantly, even if you break up with your side project, you won't regret it because it will have made your heart beat.